The problem the world faces with ISIS um, is that it has every intention of taking over control of the world and destroying the way that all of us have lived for many, many hundreds of years. Their technique is disruption, and our answer is order. With Islam, who climbed its peaks to perform jihad, answering the... The reality is it's about time we all woke up to the fact order will never stop disruption. We are fighting with conventional weapons, we're fighting with conventional techniques. The way you counter it is not to do little pockets of counter radicalization but actually to fight the enemy with the weapons they're using, because we are better at it. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today on uh, what I think is a much needed event, the first of many, uh, building civil coalitions on the fight back against the propaganda and the brand that the terrorists are using to take our children um, and children from around the world to travel thousands of miles uh, and kill other people and believe and die for a cause. We're going to be talking about messages today. Um, I think that it's really important to understand the power that the opposition has, the enemy has, and the way that they're actually using the World Wide Web and other tools to their advantage to propagate their messages. I'm the Managing Director of Quilliam, my name's Harris Rafiq, and we measured for one month, the month of Shawal last year, the propaganda, the official propaganda that was coming out of the region of Iraq and Syria. And it was in Arabic and English and other languages. And the sheer volume actually startled me. On average, ISIL were producing 38 pieces of unique propaganda every day. Never mind the sympathizers, the empathizers, all the other people that will spread these messages on, but just bear in mind, this is the kind of volume that we're up against. We brought together here today a number of people from the private sector, from the third sector from governments and from various uh, other sort of interested academics and various people. And what we really want to do is for this to be the start of coalitions of people coming together and taking the fight to these guys. You know, we've had this problem. I remember I was on the government task force after 7-7 and I was one of the people that was involved in coming up with the P for prevent. And those it was, it was called preventing violence extremism. Now, obviously, it's called Prevent, and it's changed in different ways. In the US and around the world, it's called CVE, Combating Violent Extremism. There are holes in the particular strategy, and one of the biggest holes is that it's too reliant on the government taking this battle on. Well, let me tell you now, governments are not the best placed people, institutions, to take this battle on. We need civil society coalitions. We're talking about messaging. I just want to take just a minute just to talk about why and how I got involved in this. I was born here in the UK. I'm 50 years of age. I was in the commercial sector, living my life, getting on with things, as I mentioned to a couple of people I've met today, haven't seen for a while. I was a punk rocker when I was 14, 15. That was my rebellion, joined CND, and then grew up and joined the Conservative Party mid back end of the 80s. And I was getting on with my life. And my young girl, about 11, 12 years ago, she was seven at the time, came home one day and said, Daddy, I don't want to be a Muslim. And I said, why? And she said, because Muslims are always angry and they're always killing people and they're always burning Guy Fawkes. And I thought, well, I like a good bonfire. Show me where you're getting these messages from. She turned on the TV. This was 11, 12 years ago. There were some guys that happened to be the Taliban. They were firing weapons, they looked very angry, looked like they wanted to kill somebody, and they were burning effigies in George Bush and Tony Blair. Here was a young girl, she was seven, she didn't know anything about ideology, about Islam. All she saw was mum and dad, you know, praying their prayers when, you know, when they were feeling particularly pious, fasting during Ramadan, uh, teaching her the basic faith. She didn't know anything about the faith, she didn't know anything about ideology, she just knew from the messages she was getting, she didn't want to be angry. And I sort of fell into this. 
purely off the back of that. This is the power of communication. This is the effect that communication in the day, in the, in the era that we're living in now, has on our youngsters and us as well. And we brought together a, an illustrious panel today. We've got um, Lord Bell, who I'm sure needs no introduction. He's the chairman of Bell Possinger Private, uh, was uh, one of the is one of the best known figures in the communications industry and uh, helped found Sachin Sachin in 1970 um, and has run a number of successful campaigns for the Conservative Party in general elections. And of course he advises um, the chairman of many of the leading organisations and companies around the world uh, and foreign heads of state. We've got my colleague Jonathan Russell who's head of policy uh, Jonathan, since he's been working at Quilliam, has been involved in a number of projects, including looking at youngsters and messaging, uh, working with Kofi Annan recently, uh, is an interesting project that we're working on, and really helping Quilliam set some of its strategic communications and policy. And Jonathan's going to talk about uh, some of the, the work that we've done and what we're looking to do. And then, of course, we've got Sven Hughes, who's the founder of Verbalization, uh, which is an organisation which is really a multidisciplinary hybrid team which comprises of psychologists who know how to get messages out to people, know the power of words, what actually influences people. Uh, Sven is a former PSYOPs uh, specialist and he served in the British Army and the Special Forces uh, and um, right now Sven is leading the way I guess in campaigns when it comes to marketing and propaganda against CVE and we work very closely with his organisation to produce a video, an award winning video called Love Another Brother. Before I actually ask our panellists to say a few words, the format I'm going to run is the panellists will say a few words and then I'll leave some time at the end for Q&A so please do save your questions till the end. But I want to play you a video that we produced with verbalisation, it's called Not Another Brother. It's not the only solution, it's not the only message. It's part of the messaging, and it's an example. It's probably now, if we say that this is the best we can do, we're not doing our work properly. But when we launched this, we had over half a billion impressions in the first week, and it's won a number of awards. So I just wanted to watch this video. It's about 90 seconds long. Now, you don't want to talk to me. So I snuck this letter into your jacket. Just like I did with that girl's phone number you liked at Nando's that time. Yeah, man. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> Still wish I could have seen your face when you found it. Thing is, I wish I could see your face now. Because if I could, I'd tell you. I'd tell you I was sorry. I'd tell you that I wish I could take back every time I sent you a tweet or got all gassed up saying how the West has turned its back on us. Saying that I wasn't no Mujahid, but I could see what the brothers in Syria were fighting for. And I'd tell you that I was just trying to be the big man when I kicked off on the that night. When he said I shouldn't be putting all that stuff in your head, that I should see both sides of the story. <laughs> Guess I should have listened to him, right? All I was thinking about was how everyone was looking at me. How you were looking at me. Like every brother wants his kid brother to look at him. Like I was some kind of hero. Because that's when it all changed, wasn't it? The Friday morning when we was playing Call of Duty, when it came out and you told me you were going, and you started sending me all those I still films, going to those meetings you wouldn't tell me about. And I was just like, no way, man. No way. But every time I tried to talk you round, you just threw all that stuff I'd said back in my face. Hadn't I said the West wouldn't understand us? Hadn't I said that we should fight for what we believed in? And, and the thing is, like, I knew, I knew I had. When I said fight, 
I didn't mean like that, bro. Not like that. Not if it means the last time we talk is us shouting at each other across the kitchen with mum sitting at the table bawling our eyes out. Not if it means the last memory I've got of my kid brother is him saying, I thought this was what you wanted, bro. I thought you wanted me to be a hero. Oh, as my stupid, brilliant, perfect brother, don't you get it? You've been my hero since the day you were born. So please, get all that stuff I said and just, just come home. And if you can't, and if you really are taking a path that I set you on, then I'm sorry, bruh. I'm sorry, and I hope wherever you're reading this, they're treating you like the hero I've always thought you were. I love you, bro. Love you. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask uh, Lord Bell to say a few words uh, and I'd like to hand over the platform to you. Good afternoon. Um, the reason I'm here is indeed I have a function, which is you can't have a function at the House of Lords unless you're sponsored by a peer. And I'm one of them, so I've sponsored this. Um, I'm Lord Bell. Actually, I'm Tim Bell, but you can call me my Lord. Um, and it's a very old joke. Everybody it. I'm sorry. Um, I was going to. I'm just to give you a very short presentation. It's a pure common sense presentation. I don't understand why people aren't doing it. I, no doubt, one of you will produce some brilliant reason which I haven't thought of as to why we don't do this. But anyway, it's very simple and straightforward. But it is a whole series of cliches, um, and that reminded me of a story that. Joe Haynes, who used to be the press officer of the Labour Party years ago, told me about being in the press box at the Labour Party conference in 1946 when Attlee was making a speech, and Attlee was making a speech, and Joe Haynes turned to Anaram Bevan, who was in the press box, and said, what do you think of the Prime Minister's speech? Anaram Bevan said, it were cliche after cliche after cliche. So I'm now going to give you a whole series of cliches, um, or possibly cliche. Um, it starts with a, a, a thought which I'm sure is absolutely obvious to anybody. How do I make, how do I make my technology work? Ah. It's a very simple saying that for evil to prosper, it only requires good men to do nothing. And that's exactly the situation that we're in at the moment. Um, I, if you don't think Daesh threatens our way of life, you won't agree with a word of what I'm going to say afterwards. So if you, if you think Daesh is not, not a great threat, then why not go now and not waste your time? If you do think it's a great threat, and in particular, if you think that it is probably the biggest threat to the Islamic religion in the world today, it is the reason why the Islamic religion is, is in question. If you don't realise, if you don't think that's the case, then again, you won't agree with what I'm about to tell you. What it seems to me from an outside view, I'm not an expert in any of these matters, I'm not a defence expert, I'm not a soldier, I'm not a psyops man, I'm just an ordinary human being living in the same world that you're all living in. It seems to me that Daesh used four weapons in their attempt to destroy civilization, as we know it. The first is to take space, and they use the military technique of taking over space, creating a geographic space from which they can operate. They use mil military and we fight back with aeroplanes dropping bombs. We can't get ourselves together to have a ground war. We don't have the energy to put our soldiers into. We can't agree on how to do that. On what basis we have the United Nations, which is completely toothless. Uh, the European Union is toothless. All of the organizations can't get themselves together to fight because of all of the problematical things that might happen on a geopolitical basis if we do it. So they take the space, they fill the vacuum, and that's where they operate from. Then they operate outside their space, and they use suicide bombers and terror attacks to scare the living daylights out of ordinary people about people as they go about their life. If you don't believe me, go and ask people who live in Paris. Ask the people who are here when they bombed the Jews. Ask 
the, the twin towers when they blew them up. Um, and all of this operates on behind this is what's called the big lie, which is basically a suggestion to all sorts of people that there is a better place for them to live, better place for them to fight for, which is being run by the caliphate, whoever that may be, that is, that is better than where they are. Everybody knows that's not true. And the closest thing in modern history to it is probably what Goebbels did for Nazism and practiced the big lie across the whole of Germany and then into all the countries which they took control of. And they do all of that through propaganda. You may not like the word propaganda. You may think that the big lie is part of the propaganda, and it is indeed. Um, you may not think that people are vulnerable to propaganda, but it would appear they are. And I was thinking about this and thinking, what on earth can you do about it? And I decided to look at a Churchillian speech that he gave, um, which is famously quoted by everybody, which is called, we'll fight them on the beaches. Um, and it suddenly occurred to me that we're fighting them with old conventional weapons. We have bigger bombs and bigger planes, and we can drop brimstones, and we can do all those things, and we fight them with that. But we don't fight them where they are most effective. We don't fight them in the area which they fight, which, as um, everybody will tell you, is the internet. Um, and I was going to play you that. I was going to re-record the Churchill speech, but I can't do his voice, and it doesn't quite have the same moment now. Um, uh, but actually, you would rewrite it simply this. We must fight them on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, all over the internet. And then we can win the war of words. Now that seems to me to be so simple and so straightforward and so obvious, I just can't understand why nobody grasps that point. That's the only point I wanted to make to you. Um, but the reason I'm here is because Quilliam understand that point and did try and do something about it. The film, which didn't work, which will work eventually, um, will show you what they were trying to do. Whether it's the right film or the wrong film is utterly beside the point. What is not beside the point is how it came about. It did not come about through military planning, through the Department of Defence, through the Ministry of Defence. It came about by some people who just live their lives, deciding to get together, put a message together, and put it out on the internet. It is, I'm told, the most effective piece of de-radicalisation that's been done anywhere. Uh, and, and if we don't choose to follow that example, then we must be absolutely mindless and stupid. And the only thing that will stop us doing that will be vested interest, government structures, civil service, blockage, all of those things which forever have stopped progress in our society and will continue to do so. I'll tell you one last story which I, uh, perhaps gives me some credentials. Many years ago, we won a, a request for a proposal to work for the DOD, the CIA, and the State Department of America with the American invasion force in Iraq. And we worked in Iraq for about seven years. And we had a campaign which, was, which had a, a communication campaign which the sole purpose was to persuade 70% of the Iraqis to vote at the first election following the fall of Saddam Hussein. We got that target, we made 70%. You may all argue that we got the wrong result, but then democracy does not say that you will always get a good result. Look at America. <laughs> unless, you want, unless you want to make a choice between Trump and Sanders. Um, and I remember at the first briefing, we were in um, Tampa, with all the civil servants and all the procurement officers and all the powers that be, and there was a very large general from the American Army, a five-star or 17-star or something other star general, and he asked me what we were trying to do. So I told him that's what we understood the objective to be. And he said, you're very fortunate that you've got this contract at this time. And I said, why is that, sir? He said, it's just dawned on us and it's sweeping through the White House, the State Department, the Department of Defense, that you don't change people's minds by shooting them. And that's my last message for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lord Bell. Um, an interesting point. Lord Bell mentioned fascism. I think that one of the things we must absolutely do is look at this phenomenon. Daesh, ISIL, ISIS, whatever you want to call them, did not inspire extremism. Extremism inspired them. Before ISIL, we had Al-Qaeda. Before them, we had the Muslim Brotherhood. We had the Hizb al-Sahriya. We had a whole range of groups. The overwhelming thing that binds them all together is this ideology of Islamism, which wants two things. 
It's contemporary, it's new, it wants two things. One, to set up a utopian Islamist state and enforce their version of Sharia on everybody, and secondly, to spread it around the world. We have to treat this ideology in the same way that we treat fascism and racism and other isms. Next, I'm just wondering, Jonathan uh, Russell's going to say a few words on what we're doing and how we can work together with uh, all of you, hopefully, and with globalization and with uh, Lord Bell. Mm. Well, thank you, Harris, and, and thank you, Lord Bell, for uh, the kind invitation and uh, for your insights on how, how we should be doing this. I am going to be talking predominantly about the big lie. Um, we call it something slightly different. Uh, when we, we had a look at, at Daesh and their, their propaganda output uh, in, uh, in the series that, we, that Harris mentioned earlier called The Virtual Caliphate um, that is on your seats if, if you haven't read it already, uh, we, we found something peculiar. And that peculiar thing that we found was not um, that the Daily Mail are, are accurately representing the caliphate. If you were to believe the Daily Mail or other, uh, other options are available, um, we, we think that it's all about beheading. Beheading does not inspire people to, to go over and join uh, Islamic State, although perhaps it, it has a role. Overwhelmingly, over 52% of Islamic State propaganda focused on the big lie. We, we stratified it into what we've called utopian, uh, the utopian caliphate dream, uh, apocalyptic utopianism. Uh, and it's that that they are selling. Uh, and all of the other elements of, of Islamic State propaganda, whether it's vulnerability, whether it's victimhood, whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's mercy, rule of law, uh, or indeed brutality, all of them come together in, in various ways to, to reinforce this big lie, to reinforce this utopia. So I want to talk about how we might counter that uh, and just focus on this big lie throughout because um, there's a danger when we start looking at, at Daesh propaganda that, uh, that we focus tactically or that we focus simply on, on admiring the problem, uh, as, as a colleague said. Um, aren't they great at using social media? Isn't the production value of their videos amazing? Look at how they've filled the vacuums filled, uh, left by the Iraq War or the Arab Spring. Whose fault is that again? Uh, what do we call them, by the way? Is it, is it Daesh? Is it ISIL? Is it ISIS? Are they Islamic? Are they a state? When and how are they going to attack us? All of these are, to a certain extent, interesting questions, but hold us back in the response to, our, to the propaganda. Because the stakes are high, because we're perfectionists, because we know it's a live situation and we don't want to inadvertently offend people, we strive for a panacea a golden pill, a single counter-narrative, if you like, that will render them redundant. This won't be found, and striving for it will fuel inertia. It also stops us working together to tackle it. The counter-extremism response in the last decade has focused on the bad guys spreading extremism, the places in which they did it, and at times the people vulnerable to this extremism. Less, I think, was done on the extremist ideas and the narratives and the arguments themselves. And I'm pleased that the new counter-extremism strategy changes that and addresses it. But now we're focusing on the ideas and the narratives. The danger is we risk making the same mistake. Who is spreading extremist propaganda? Where are they doing it? Who is watching it? How do we stop them watching it? We've got to ask better questions. And I'm going to ask some better questions, I hope throughout this, this afternoon before you guys get, get an opportunity to ask some, some even better questions. What is it that ISIS spins in this big lie and why? Why is it effective? Is all ISIS propaganda for the same audience? And is it all effective? Where are the weak points in ISIS narratives that we can exploit? Asking these questions will give us a chance to provide answers and, and hopefully shape our, our response. But these responses will have different target audiences, different messengers, different messages. And if we were to show the, the Not Another Brother film, as, as we will do hopefully later, um, you'll see that, that with this in mind, we've thought very carefully about the messenger and the message and the words that we're using and the platform for disseminating it. It isn't the only answer. It's just one of, I hope, a, a much broader strategy. Uh, but it's that strategy that I want to focus on. So why does ISIS invest so much time in the big lie? It does that because it provides added value to several different target audiences. It can compel these audiences to take action, crucially. It doesn't just need people to, to watch its YouTube videos, and, and nor do we. 
ISIS needs them to, to sign up to, to be recruits, to, to be cannon fodder for their, for their, for their Bakia uh, Tatamadud, their, for their expansion eventually. Now, if we simply in response aim for, for a greater number of views, for it, for it to have uh, 600 million impressions in the first, first week, we're not going to get very far. I think that's impressive stats compared with the rest. It's maybe even impressive stats compared to ISIS output as well. But what we should be focusing on is, is the next step. How can we make people take action? And what does that action look like for us? So who is the audience for, for ISIS propaganda? I've, I've, I'm going to just pull out two. There are, there are dozens more. I think ISIS utopia propaganda is, is effective because it's broad enough to catch many different target audiences, but can be made human enough and focused enough to inspire this behavioral change. Local populations in Iraq and Syria, one particular target audience for, for ISIS, who feel marginalized either because of their real or perceived lack of state service provision, uh, or the lack of equality and opportunity in, uh, in, in uh, Saddam Hussein's Iraq, or, or Nouri al-Maliki's Iraq, or, or Bashar al-Assad's Syrian society, ISIS show the big lie and say they offer these services. They say that they'll generate respect for Sunni Muslims. When the responses have been development focused to this propaganda, to reduce the marginalization of the, this target audience, they haven't, I don't think, been joined up enough with strategic communications efforts to tackle the sectarianism, to tackle the broader support for Islamist extremism in the region that make people as vulnerable to recruitment distinct from radicalization. Second big audience uh, of ISIS utopia propaganda, I think, is Western populations. And, and here, you know, we've got to think about what they're trying to achieve. Is it simply to recruit people as cannon fodder? Or are they looking to, to invoke a response, to, to invoke a response from society that polarizes uh, Muslim communities and, and non-Muslim communities? Or, or invokes a state response that, that will shut down civil liberties and, and, and over-securitize this, this area. In this way, uh, I think they also target, clearly, um, uh, an audience that, that might have grievances about how state and society treat them, whether that's so-called state-sponsored Islamophobia or, or something more at a societal level. Now, I believe that this audience is primed for ISIS propaganda by nonviolent Islamist groups who fuel a victimhood narrative, who normalize the politicization of a theology that, that simply doesn't have to be violent, and stoke conspiracy theory. In that sense, ISIS are not the main enemy here, but rather a broader trend of extremism. ISIS only have to build their commitment to an ideology or a worldview and facilitate their transition from a contemplation phase towards action. Now, by contrast, the behavioral change we're looking for is essentially a call to inaction. And any response that we come out with that, that simply says, don't go to Raqqa, you might not like it, you'll get hurt, is, is not going to, is not going to ha have an impact on a target audience. And, and for the, so for the first thing, we need to understand that audience better than ISIS do, because uh, I think we've got that wrong so far. Secondly, a second main trend that they tap into, I think they're, they're anti-establishment at a time when there is general societal malaise about the state of the establishment. In this regard, although perhaps not identically, they've recognized the same trends that meant New Hampshire this morning voted for, for Trump and Sanders. Similar trends in, in Europe in the post-Blair Clinton era meant a rise of, of the Occupy movement, a rise of Pegida across Europe, a rise of Syriza at, at a political level in, in Greece. Now, I, I, I'm not commenting on the substance of these groups, nor in explicitly comparing them with ISIS, except to say that they're able to inspire action with anti-establishment rhetoric. The whole Islamist spectrum fits into this trend, and the jihadist fringe simply takes advantage of it. Now that's crucial for our response. If we respond as the establishment, if we respond uh, as Quilliam, often painted or easily painted as the establishment, we might not get very far, and we might uh, we might not help, uh, or we, not, we might not stop uh, ISIS exploiting it. So that's the second thing to think about. Third thing, ISIS strategically uses Islamic motifs about how they're building a caliphate state, enforcing God's law, carrying out jihad to protect and defend the Ummah. In this, they tap into various ideological elements that have become normalized in Muslim communities across Britain. 
Now let's be clear. Khalifa, Sharia, Umar, Jihad are all very much in the Quran and not inherently violent. It is simply their politicized interpretations and exploitations that ISIS leverage. And it's this kind of politics that's become normalized and has not been effectively countered. Whether or not some extremists go from nonviolent extremism to jihadist terrorism, the normalization of the ideas clearly creates an atmosphere in which this jihadist violence can thrive. This is not some conveyor belt theory. This is not looking at an individual level, but it's simply looking at, at atmospheres. And if we're talking as, um, uh, as, as a, uh, a key Google Ideas uh, chap mentioned uh, at Chatham House um, very recently uh, and said that this is a digital counterinsurgency, <coughs> we should think about an insurgency and a counterinsurgency. And we should know that, that they thrive in, which, uh, in, in an atmosphere uh, that allows them to thrive. Not everyone in, in that atmosphere is violent, nor, uh, nor hates their country necessarily, but, but if these ideas become normalized uh, and these pseudo-religious elements um, uh, are allowed to thrive, then, then I think ISIS will, will continue to act with impunity at home or, or abroad. Now, it's got another element to it, I think, as well. These, these pseudo-religious elements protect ISIS and other extremist narratives from criticism. Counter-narratives or opposition to ISIS can very easily be painted as, Islam as Islamophobia, if I were to do it, or if Harris were to do it, apostasy. Now, I think it's for this reason that we've struggled to engage Muslim communities to tackle this poisonous ideology, and beyond, beyond them, why government ha have found it very difficult to do. Um, and, and I think we've got to tackle that head-on if, if we do it. Of course, we've got to be sympathetic, but we've got to understand that exploitation. It has something to do with Islam. It is not Islam itself. The next thing uh, I think that ISIS do particularly well, uh, although um, uh, not as well as, as our combined capabilities, of course, uh, is, is to grow with technology. They manage to reach a Western target audience that identifies with those first two trends, not in any groundbreaking way, but simply communicating in the way that we do. They use Twitter to broadcast and debate. They use Facebook to talk to friends. They use YouTube to watch and share videos. They use Kik to plan. They use Telegram when there's something worth encrypting. And they use Google Hangouts when they're talking to Google employees. Um, it, it recognizes that people with similar views, hundreds or thousands of miles apart, can share experiences, reinforce world, world views by, by building these echo chambers. And, and we've got to think about that when we respond. I don't think the, the response thus far has dealt with these echo chambers and has dealt with the technology that, that ISIS are using. The response here is not to shut down technology. It's simply to use it better than ISIS use it. To, to overwhelmingly have a, having a shut down response, to, to, to laud the fact that, that Twitter has, has closed so many accounts is, is, is peculiar. It's a peculiar way around if you think about it. This is us, a, a 21st century nation fighting a, a medieval death cult, and, and we're the ones that, that want to shut down freedom? I, I think that's peculiar. If, if we're going to address these aspects, I think what we really need to do, in, in a pithy phrase, is to get counter-extremism fatwas into tweets. We need to make it accessible to, to this target audience. Lastly, because ISIS doesn't radicalize per se, but simply recruits the self-selecting, it can be hugely action-oriented. Its propaganda works because it gives a very clear, tangible, and actionable follow-up to the communique. Attack the West, join the caliphate. It's two options for you. And I think it does this effectively by monopolizing two things that you'd think would be mutually exclusive. It monopolizes winning, hanging on half-truths that look believable to anyone who isn't bothered digging for more information. But counterintuitively, perhaps, it monopolizes losing through their victimhood narratives. Any failure at all is painted as the Western Shia Zionist Crusader Alliance targeting Islam. And commitment to the in-group, therefore, ISIS, is, is reinforced as they rally round the black and white flag. Now, this, closed down, this closes down the space in which we can operate. Uh, and, and it's something that we've got to tackle head on before we come out with a response. Our response has been less engaging, less tangible. I think we haven't offered a, a call to, to action to, 
the Call of Duty generation. This isn't the MTV generation listening to, 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 to stuff anymore. This is people that want to be first, first player game oriented. They want to be plugged in. They want to communicate with the, their fellow, fellow game players. So we've got to, got to catch up with the times. And, and our response has been uh, overwhelmingly to offer a call to inaction, not a call to action. And, and that must change. So I simply have uh, three, three suggestions. Uh, three recommendations, and I know Sven um, is, is going to talk a little bit more about this, but three suggestions to, to think about at a strategic level to counter ISIS propaganda more effectively. First off, let's start earlier to last longer. For as long as we hold up ISIS as a bogeyman, we'll miss the Islamism for the jihadism. We need to broaden the com counter communications effort to include all forms of extremism, violent and non-violent, Islamist extremism and anti-Muslim hatred, which have a, a negative symbiotic relationship. As compelling as ISIS's caliphate is to recruits around the world, its plug for territory leaves it exposed to the might of our military coalition, whether from air or, or ground. But as, as Lord Bell said, killing people doesn't change their mind. There will be new groups with new aims spreading the same ideology and narratives unless we counter them root and branch. Even at the moment, other terrorist organizations in the region and elsewhere, Jabhat al-Nusra, for example, are learning from ISIS and their communications model and mimicking it to reap rewards. Overwhelmingly, I'm much more worried about Jabhat al-Nusra than I am by ISIS. And if, if, we, if we shift our focus and, and forget about ISIS and focus on Jabhat al-Nusra, we'll, we'll lose that war too. We've got to tackle root and branch this, this whole problem. Um, We've got to scale up this war of words, and that will involve diversifying the target audiences, the messages, the messengers, the strategies, and future-proofing a counter-communication strategy. We must accept that Islamist extremists are able to shape-shift and develop new approaches quicker than we've managed so far, quicker than a Western government's managed so far. So, so let's think about that now, and let's get ahead of the curve, because otherwise we'll be, we'll be meeting again in, in six months or a year's time. Second suggestion, let's, let's understand the target audiences and build broader trends, uh, and the broader trends, to build a more strategic response. If we consider who the target audience is, and how or why ISIS effectively engages them, our answers will, will shape this response. It may well be that we need to engage with credible voices like mothers, formers, victims, fellow Sunni Muslims to be the messengers for some of this work. It may even be that government needs to be one step removed further from a communications campaign to avoid inadvertently reinforcing anti-establishment sentiment. And to avoid perhaps securitizing this work and reinforcing a fringe perspective among this target audience that the West relies on, on spies. Now, if we furthermore understand that a target audience uses a particular kind of technology, we should respond in kind. If Islamists get their news from a fringe conspiracy theory blog, taking out an advert in the Telegraph isn't going to reach them. And if ISIS does indeed tap into a generation that needs action, let's not sell them inaction. Let's offer interactive, engaging follow-ups that are online and offline. Let's not just tell people to retweet something or like something, <coughs> which generates self-selecting echo chambers of our own, only preaching to, to our converted. Let's engage with the third sector and the plethora of grassroots national campaigns and international campaigns and link it up with this counter-communication strategy. Let's, let's work with, with people who see this in development terms, as well as those who see it in national security terms, or strategic communications terms, or, or, or community cohesion co terms domestically. And last of all, let's work better together. The three target, uh, the target audiences I mentioned would elicit responses from various different government departments. I know government is is, is improving at, at crossing Whitehall and, and working together and, and working very, very effectively with, with others in the coalition to do this. But let's learn from each other too. It may well be that the Home Office has tips on sensitively engaging Muslim communities or the Ministry of Defence has, has tips on target audience analysis or, or atmospherics. Both are relevant to both situations and I, and I think we've got to cross-pollinate more. But beyond government, I think... Uh, we should work together more effectively with the private sector and the third sector and learn from other people in, in various different, um, various different neighbouring problem areas. Think about how effective public health campaigners have been at stopping people smoking and getting people to wear condoms. We've, we can tap into that and, and learn from those campaigns because we're, we're asking for a not dissimilar form of, uh, form of behavioural change. 
And let's work with young people who are not scared by Snapchat and its encryption to the extent that they want to ban it, as was, as was mooted in, in the House of Lords um, last, uh, last or, uh, September. But let's, let's understand that it satisfies market demand for us as much as it does for ISIS. Let's unite our efforts and, and show extremism some muscle. So this may mean that government is best suited to, to developing a strategic direction, building capacity, funding uh, various projects, and funding this, this consortium that I'm talking about. But even if it's recognized that government isn't the best to, to deliver by itself, I think we've got to engage more in the private sector, more in the third sector, to, to revolutionize this space with competition and innovation and, uh, and work together to, to deliver some of it free from the shackles of, of the establishment tag. So to conclude, let's be self-critical again of the video that we haven't managed to play. Um, 600 million impressions in the first week is great, but did we get high enough value on those views? Did we create significant behavioral change? What could we have done better to impact among supporters and sympathizers of ISIS? And how could we have delivered a better strategy, followed up with more content, engaged online and offline with the people who watched it? These are the questions that, that we ask ourselves at, at Quilliam every day, because we know that, that making a 100 second video that has done remarkably well is not good enough, because ISIS continue to, to, to amaze. So yes, of course, this is just one collaboration of, of uh, one uh, example of collaboration between different sectors. But please remember, we're committed to doing more of this. I hope you can be committed to doing more of this uh, and to work harder with us to win this war of words and counter the extremism that threatens us all. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. A um, couple of points I just want to pick up on before Sven comes on. I think that you're absolutely right. For decades now, this concept of the utopian Islamist caliphate has been sold to our children, to our youngsters, without being challenged by society. We must do that. Shutting down social media web uh, sites doesn't work. If we're shutting down 1,100 every week, or the social media companies and the internet providers are shutting down 1,100 every week and it's not coming down, that should be an indication that it's not working on its own. We have people who are issuing death threats against my staff at Quilliam, and they're on their 80th something account. We need to challenge them, and we need to do the old things that Jonathan has talked about. These groups, the Islamist radicalizers, want to make everything binary. Everything is black and white, as far as they're concerned. You're either with them or against them. They try and move, and they've told us in their publications, they want to move people out of the grey zones. The grey zones are where we need to take the battle. And who better than Sven, our next speaker, at actually taking this battle to them and winning the war of words. Right, good afternoon. Um, what I'd like to do for, for the next 10, 12 minutes is, is um, talk about really the opportunities that are presenting themselves because of Daesh propaganda. What, what I'm not going to do here is sort of re-amplify their messaging and their content. I think perhaps in, in many instances the media in this country and, and internationally at the moment perhaps doing that job a little bit too much for us. And actually we need to get back now to, to the opportunities and how to fight it rather than just spreading it further and further and further on their behalf. Now. One thing you can say, looking at Daesh propaganda, though, is the sheer volume of it is instructive, going to the points that the, the, the previous speakers were saying. Now, one way of looking at that, and the, and the lazy way of looking at that, is saying, therefore, that is their strength. Propaganda is their strength, and they are therefore very good at it, and, and so forth. In fact, perhaps the more interesting way, and the opportune way of looking at it, is saying it is actually their weakness because they are now so dependent on propaganda. And certainly coming from a military perspective or a psychological operations perspective, that immediately gives you a fissure rather than opinion, a fissure's opinion sort of uh, point of view on this. Now, if we say, therefore, that, that 
uh, we can use it as their weakness, they're dependent on, on propaganda, their dependence on propaganda. That brings into pay, uh, play questions of undermining their notions of credibility, <laughs> undermining their notions of recruitment, and, and their funding. And of course, this explains why so much good work is being done by the contest strategy, prevent, and the counter-extremism strategy. There's a lot of good work cha challenging their ideologies online. There's community work in terms of dialogue over division, of enfranchisement and education. And that's government-led initiatives, specifically with that mandate. And that's excellent. It's certainly not for me to, 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 to judge that. There's also third sector uh, support in that area in terms of reaching into the grassroots and into mosques and into schools and reinforcing and re-supporting uh, the government-led initiatives. Okay, so there's a sort of the, the, the need, propaganda is important, and there's a response in terms of the government-led initiatives supported by third sector. So in theory, therefore, we can all sleep well at night saying that's it. Then, then really we're talking about Daesh being a one-generation issue, a bit like Bader meinhof group. And we can all sleep well tonight knowing that it's all under control. Well, sadly, obviously that's not actually the case. Um, not least because just quite simply, despite the best efforts, a government-led initiative comes with certain risks and realities that that faces. A top-down approach by its very nature will run against latent cynicism in certain of our communities. The very fact that it's government-led. The very fact that it's government-led, and there's no, there's no uh, value judgment in saying this, means that the response time for government-led counter-propaganda is, of course, slower, and for good reasons it's slower than the stuff that's coming in from Daesh. You also have, then, recruitment issues. You have funding issues, and I'm not going to get into the whole debate about cuts and so forth, but obviously it's a factor. And you also have, then, other you know, geostrategic things that happen in the world that may take away the effort against Daesh for, again, very valuable, re valid reasons. Okay, so, but we've just said that, that Daesh propaganda needs to be and, and must be subverted because it is actually key to undermining their entire existence. So the need is there, but it's an unmet need because obviously government-led can't do that alone because of the reasons I've specified. So who's going to pick up the slack? So we could turn to the MOD to say, can you pick up the slack, please? And I know there's representatives here today of the MOD. Well, obviously, for a domestic audience, that's not appropriate. And I'm, I'm not sure it's even legal, actually, but it's certainly not appropriate, as we learned in Ireland. Uh, we could turn to the FCO. Well, that's not appropriate in this instance, because they're busy with foreign work, uh, as they should be. We could turn to our domestic security services. Well, I would like to think, and I'm sure we'd like to think with, with confidence, that they'd be more interested in pursue than prevent at this moment in time. And, and, and jolly good that they are too, so we can genuinely sleep at night. Okay, so who's going to pick up the slack? Maybe it's the third sector. Well, that's not really their specialism, strategic communications. I mean, there may be skills there and pockets of skills and, and good luck to them, but it's not really what they do every day and what they really, you know, what they're known for. So, of course, all roads start leading now towards the private sector. And that makes this a delicate conversation, especially as someone standing here from the private sector, because it immediately sounds as though it's a pitch. It sounds as though it's a sales pitch for the tenders and so forth from RIC or the National Security Council. So what I want to do instead in this, in, this, uh, in this talk, just quickly, is explore what are the ways, instead of through the normal tender process, to enfranchise that extraordinary talent we have in the private sector and bring it to bear on the war of words against Daesh. Because my goodness, we have some of the best people in the world working in the communications industries in terms of advertising, marketing, but filmmaking, music making. You know, we are internationally known. If the only way it can be, uh, that talent can be accessed, it's a bit like having some of your best players on a football pitch sitting on the sidelines, waiting to be called onto the pitch, but they're not because of the tender process. So, that's the sort of mandate I wanted to sort of look at over the, over the last few weeks. And, and of course, there's, there's a lot of good work that's already done in the charity space by the private sector. They give in-kind support when there's capacity in the, in the advertising and marketing industry. It is quite normal to give in-kind support to charity clients. It gives young creatives the chance to, to sort of really spread their wings creatively, cut their teeth by turning around and saying, well, look, here's a charity client. I need to develop my book. Therefore, of course, I'd like to proactively do some work. There you are. I hope you use it. Good luck to you. And if you do use it, that's great for my book. That's actually quite invigorating and exciting for the creatives out there who love a challenge, who look forward to, to new briefs. Why couldn't our country be our brief? 
So I went out to some stakeholders and, and, and just wanted to take that mandate to them. And it seems a strange matter, as I said, for the private sector to sort of take back out, say, can we, uh, can we not get paid for the work? You know, I understand that, but I also used to wear a uniform. And actually, funnily enough, one of my, my instructors is, is sitting in the audience, which is lovely to see. Um, when, to, when took it to some stakeholders, I, I went and spoke to a former head of one of the security services in our country and got his opinion. And uh, I spoke to some serving and, and former members of, of military uh, psychological operations and now 77 Brigade, and some members of parliament, and some quite heavy hitters, but also some non-heavy hitters from the private sector, and some NGOs. I've gone around and done quite a few interviews behind the scenes, just talking to people, saying, if that's a problem, and we know that private sector enfranchisement might be the solution, and diversifying the voices in the private sector and bringing them to bear, and groundswelling and, uh, that, that, how could we do that? And what was really exciting to see was the unity with which everyone approached that and said, yes, we want in. Let's make that happen. Let's make new systems and processes because the threat is now so great, we need to think different. And we need to be accepting of the fact of getting rid of our vested interests, getting rid of our preconceptions, and actually collectively sitting around the table saying, can we re-engineer this? Now, the worry, though, was also what I heard very loud and clear from the private sector was, but I don't really want to do proactive work in case, in case I get it wrong. Because the stakes are so high in counter-terrorism, I'm, I'm at risk of meddling. And I, when I've done this before and tried to do this before, I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm scared that my staff will come into to the line of fire. I'm st uh, scared that, that Ricker will be annoyed or the National Security Council will be annoyed. So there's almost a blockage of all this wonderful talent there that at the moment isn't being brought to bear. And I know in this room that there are enough people with enough open minds to say we could re-engineer that and reimagine that for the sake of our country. So, having done these interviews, the five ideas that were, were offered up through the interview process, I'm not going to take credit for them myself, they were collectively from that group of people that I mentioned. And I hope that they proactively enable us to maybe collectively take a step in the right direction together. The first one was the need for a steering committee comprising public and private sector representatives, fine with the appropriate guidance from RIC or the N NSC, but a group of people that come together with a specific mandate to diversify the amount of voices that can engage from the private sector, to unify the strategy, but to diversify the voices. Okay, Number one. Now, I'm only going to top line this, but I'm happy to talk in detail afterwards with anyone who'd like to. I'd like to try and make this happen. Any of these, you know, we're in, if you're in, so from, from our perspective. Yeah? Now, that's number one idea. Number two idea was an incubator process. Now, I believe Nightworks does this technically. The MOD uh, goes into an NDA environment with the likes of BAE systems and, and incubates and pressure tests innovative solutions to the new threats that are being faced by our country. Okay, So it may be an IED or something of like that, a new way of an IED being done. And so they will go into a room together and under NDA, under NDA will say, look, let's, let's co-create, let's collaborate, let's see what we can pressure test. Way beyond there being any notion of a brief, can you just do it for the sake of your country because you believe in this, because you actually want to do it, because you think there's a moral imperative to do that because we're under threat and, I, and all credit to the likes of BAE and other companies I don't know about who are involved in Nightworks, it sounds as though it's been incredibly impressive and incredibly good results have come from it. Why aren't we doing that for the information operations space? Why aren't we collaboratively doing that behind closed doors as necessary in forums like this to give the fighting chance to the public sector to say, look, we've got some other brains here who are doing this every day. Can we bring that to bear for you? Now, of course, it will then go to tender, and I don't want to get into all that. Then may the best man win. But let's first collaborate earlier on upstream to co-create solutions together. The next idea, there are only five, the next idea, number three, is a more proactive and structured way of skill sharing. Now, it's something that our company's been involved in, I know that other companies are sitting in the audience as well. It's taking people who are currently in the private sector or in the public sector, vice versa, and saying, why not spend a week with us? Why not come and learn what it feels like? The battle rhythm of the private sector is perhaps a little bit faster because of the nature of the free market economy and so forth than the battle rhythm that you're used to. Now, we've done that as a company. We've had a, a, a wonderful uh, experience recently of taking someone for a year and then coming from public sector, coming into private sector, going back into public sector. Um, they brought as much as I hope we gave them, and it's been a wonderful process, and I would certainly advocate it of anyone in the Stratcom space to consider that. And, but the, the interviewees were asking, can we have that a more structured 
way. Now, of course, the steering committee, if we created that steering committee, it could do the next two things. It could facilitate the incubator. It could facilitate also the skill sharing in a more proactive and constructive way. The fourth idea that came through was taking the private sector skills and putting them more firmly and directly into the communities that DIASH is targeting in our communities. Okay? Now, I know Google and Facebook have done brilliant work in this, in, in the digital space, that basically enfranchise these vulnerable, okay, that's a broad term, but these vulnerable communities to so essentially talk back using social media more effectively, to make them a bit more streetwise, to answer back to DIASH. Now, I don't know, and I don't believe at the moment, but I'm open to, to hear otherwise, and let's go to questioning on this, but I don't believe that's happening proactively from our industry, from the private sector, marketing, advertising, filmmaking, to go to those communities and say, let's make you better at having your voice heard. Let's make you more professional and more slick so you can talk back yourself. It's all very well giving it to tenders, and it has to get some big advertising agency involved. Isn't it much more exciting to take some of our skills and say, you know what, there must be hundreds hundreds of people in London, creative people are happy to give up a day of their time to go into those communities in, with structure, with RICU approval and guidance, and enable and enfranchise those unheard voices to become heard, to give them that stimulus and that support and that confidence. And then the fifth idea that came through loud and clear from the interviews was could we please have an online hub, a, a, a repository for proactive work that is being made by the private sector in this space? Somewhere that can, you can almost put your work anonymously so that the likes of Riku or the third space can take it and use it appropriately and disseminate, disseminate it appropriately. Now you might think, why in God's name would anyone give away free work? Yeah? We have, in my company and every, I'm not trying to push my company, I have lots of other marketing agencies all over the, uh, the country and London and so forth have tremendously talented young creatives who want to show what they can do, who aren't sometimes getting the chance on the accounts they want to work on. You know, you want to go and work on Ford, you earn your right to get on to Ford and, uh, or whatever the big account may be. That young talent in some instances, the very talent that Daesh is actually trying to uh, attract themselves, okay? They want to make good work. They want to be creative. They want to take on challenging briefs. If they were given direction at colleges, they were given direction by our industry, if they were given direction and guidance by Riku and a place to put that work, then suddenly you're enabling the masses to speak with one voice. And you're actually making this not just a niche st stovepipe problem with a few vested interests to treaty communications firms, you are opening it up to the genuine wider community. And that is how we're going to win the, the, the war of words against Daesh, I would recommend. Now, that's what we did with the Quilliam film that you haven't seen, and whether or not you will see it. If not, please just type in Not Another Brother on, on, on Google. Um, we were invited to take part and we accepted the brief because we wanted to do it and essentially it was to make an intervention viral against the recruitment methods of, of, of Daesh. It was a matter of, of, of you know, assessing their target audience, of assessing their production and distribution methods, their narratives, their language, their, the ways in which they were doing it themselves and then we wrote, produced and disseminated the film on behalf of Quilliam ourselves. We did it because we thought it was the right thing to do. And we did it, and that's weird, isn't it? It's a private company saying that. We did it because it was the right thing to do. And we did it because we thought it would work. And it did work, and as you've heard, supposedly, it's the most, the most sort of successful counter radicalization film that's, that's ever been made online. That's not for me to say or to judge. What I can say and judge, though, is the pride and the satisfaction and the experience within my team made that an exceptionally value, invaluable investment from a, from a private sp perspective as a company owner. And it is absolutely something we will want to do again and would do again. But we need better strategic direction to do it. And there are other companies and other individuals and creatives out there who will be feeling the same way. So to sort of wrap up, and I've probably gone way over time and apologies if I have, but um, to sort of wrap up, it's, it's what I would love to think is that we can sit here in a year from now, perhaps with better technology next time, and with a steering committee in place and with lots of examples of work that's been made essentially pro bono by the private sector because there are reasons why they would want to be brought onto the pitch. There are good and justified reasons why they would want to engage. And then we can discuss that. 
Daesh is certainly challenging us to think in these new ways, both in the private sector and in the public sector, but it's our opportunity to turn those challenges into opportunities. And it's exactly the fact that we have that decision and that right to do that, to make that choice, to make those decisions for ourselves, that of course lies at the heart of the democratic process that we stand for, that they are trying to undermine. And it is therefore, in my belief at least, our choices and our decisions that therefore should absolutely be part of the solution, and part of the solution and the way in which to win the wars against uh, Daesh. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sven. There is light at the end of the tunnel. We're going to try and play this video one more time before we go to questions and answers. Georgia, are we there?